to take this time to thank every one of y'all for coming out here. And I know as we gather together on the Lord's Day, we come together to worship in spirit and in truth and to hear what God has to say to us. We use His Word as a guide in our only standard that we go by. And this morning we're going to continue a series of lessons that I've been talking about the last couple of times that I've got to speak. And I think it's something that we really need to keep in mind. As we think about these things. Spiritual wellness. As we've talked about this before, we oftentimes go to the doctor for different things that bother us and get checkups and tests, you know, to see what's going on. And as I related, four stitch in time saves nine. You catch something earlier, realize that there is a problem, that you can do something about that. And that goes with spiritual affairs as well. If we check on ourselves, spiritually speaking, when we see things that need to be worked upon, we can have that opportunity to do that. We talked about a couple words or phrases and stuff, and one of them would probably uh, apply more to a uh, physical setting, or, or, but we're going to make a spiritual application to it. It talks about people with a sedentary lifestyle. It's when a person is physically inactive and does little or no physical movement or exercise. Sometimes you think about that in a spiritual aspect. If you don't do nothing to grow as a Christian, what happens? You wither and die. The parable of the sower points it out to us that as, you know, sometimes the cares of the world, these different things, distractions comes and chokes the word and takes it away. So we see that that's dangerous. So we don't want to be, we want to be proactive as Christians in our growth. Also, I want us to think about a word that describes a person's apathy. It is a lack of interest or enthusiasm or concern. That could be for a lot of things you think about it in the world. But I want us to think about this more from a spiritual standpoint. If we quit having concern for God's Word, understanding what He has to say for us, what He expects of us, what He wants for us to do, if we don't pay attention to it and put time into it and in growth, what happens to us? Our spiritual well-being suffers because of that. And some of the things that we've talked about already in the first two lessons help us to think about some of the things. We talked about spiritual, the idea of hearing. You remember, and uh, Dave this morning talked about the Bible study there a little bit, or it might have been his lesson when he talked about he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, sometimes people hear lessons being taught, but they don't pay attention to it. They don't comprehend it. They don't grasp it. They don't apply it to their lives. Hearing is important. We talked about different kinds of hearing, you know, and we've seen the kind of hearing that we need to be. It's like the ones the Brians had talked about in Acts 17 11, that they received the word daily. Search the scriptures to see if those things were so. In the next lesson, we talked about reading because we, heard, we looked at several different phrases or passages where Jesus said, have you not read? So, you, you know, think about that. If you're standing there on judgment day and maybe one particular thing and, and to be told, you, have you not read? We have an obligation for spiritual growth. Hearing and reading is part of that. That's good for our spiritual health and well-being. Those are things that we need to be concerned about. So as we continue this series of lessons, this one's going to be on how well do you pray. I know we had a little bit of a conversation Wednesday night talking about prayer and the different things to do. And this is not going to be an exhaustive study, but it's just talking about the importance of prayer. I put together a lesson once before because where I was at, we had some, uh, you know, some new converts, hadn't been created very long, and I called it Prayer 101, just some of the basics, you know. There's not like what you say you know, a, a particular pattern, but there are things, in, in a way, they are a particular pattern. There are things that need to be there. But we're going to, you know, in that study, I thought that was helpful. And it's just like all these studies, I think, is uh, with our theme, spiritual growth, it's important for all of us to never forget the things that we've learned, or for new converts, young Christians, to continue learning, or to understand the things that we've talked about or that's important to us. And praying is something that we need to realize. What a great privilege that we have to be able to go to God. Because John 9, 31 says God does not hear sinners' prayers. So you think about it, a privilege to have God hear your prayers and to answer them as a child of God. So we want to grow and continue in thinking about those things. As we get into our lesson this morning, I want us to think about, just for a second, because as we think about prayer, you know, we think, I want us to think about Jesus as the Son of God and His habit of prayer. I think it's interesting. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. So He Himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. 
Now think about this. Why did he do that? To get away from the cares, the distractions, the things that might keep you from focusing and, and concentrating? That's a good habit for all of us to do. And our Lord seemed the need to do that. Also, Mark 135, chapter 1, verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. You see this habit of that. I know a lot of times in our public prayers and worship, you know, different men take the lead, take the role in that, and that's good. And that's what we're expected to do. But, you know, as an individual, when we have a chance to get away, just like I've already pointed out, Jesus saw the need for that. It should be no different for us as well. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 tells us, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out on the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. You think about having something so much on your mind that you concentrate and you pray for so long. I don't, I'm sure probably somebody, if you've ever been in a situation that they're struggling with something, have, might have even went to sleep praying, just have things on their mind. But you think about this decision, if you read the context of what he's talking about there, the reason that he's doing that, he picks the apostles after that. So sometimes you think about decisions, when you're making big decisions that could affect us spiritually, what do you do? You pray about it. You consult God's word about it. That's important for us as we think about this habit of prayer. But I wanted to point these passages out to consider what Jesus in his habit of prayer. I want us to consider a parable that he taught. And I think this is really interesting for us as we build this concept of the need for prayer. The parable of the persistent widow. Luke chapter 18 verse 1. And then he spoke a parable unto them and, and that men always had ought to pray and not lose heart. Say there was a certain city, a judge, who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came in to him saying, Get justice for me, for my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her own continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and Shall not God avenge his own elect, who cry day and night to him, though he bears long for them? I tell you that, they, that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? As we think about this idea of faith, when we pray to God, we have to have the faith that we know and believe that God can deliver what it needs. We understand Prayer is conditional. It's according to his, his will, not what we want, because he might see something that's better for us. But there's two different points out of this passage I want us to see and, I, and to really pay attention to. And the first one is when we pray, we have not ought to lose heart. Sometimes our prayers might not be answered right then, but keep praying. Be, you know, don't give up on it. And the second one would be. The idea will you find faith? Will people continue believing that they still keep praying? That's important for us to think about. We realize that God is able to give what He has promised. So our faith and everything needs to be strong. You think about our faith is an expression, you know, prayer is a, an expression of our faith in God. Our prayer life is. It reveals if we have lost heart in our service to God. You know, sometimes when something bad happens and you can't think to pray to God, Something's wrong with your spiritual health. If something good happens and you don't thank the faith, give thanksgiving for it, something's wrong. We need to acknowledge, you know, where the blessings come from or when we struggle that we need help. This is important for us. As we continue on with this study, these are some of the things I want us to think about. Don't lose faith. Keep praying. And make it an important part of your life. As we talked about in Ephesians 5, 17, it says... Pray without ceasing. You know, we're always supposed to be thankful for those things and acknowledge it to God. That's important for us. As along with the theme of the rest of these outlines, we want to think about the different type of people that are prayers, not prayers. People that pray. But as we think about this, this is important. Those who never pray. You know, sometimes as a creator, or atheist or agnostic, some people... Atheists don't believe there is a God. But as agnostics, sometimes 
They question, but they're not for sure. But I think that we need to be the type of people that we want to exhort one another. But Christians also lose heart and lose their faith sometimes as we talk about getting weak. But think about Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Beware, brother, lest there be any one of you an evil heart of unbelief, departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sometimes we can be dragged away in a life of sin or debauchery or activities or whatever, and it draws us away. Then we stop praying. Some people never did start like we talk about in this instance. But we have to be on guard and be, see the dangers of that. You know, a lot of times sin, when it comes, it's not like you can see Satan, like as some people might picture, if they have an image in their mind, somebody with horns and all that, that, that automatically sticks out. Sin's not like that. Temptation don't come like that. You don't see the danger in it. So sometimes if we let our life slip, we can get in this kind of a situation. But we don't want to. Amen. If we think about different type of prayers, those who never pray. Jesus was concerned that the people not reach this point. You know, a lot of times in the world, the way the world is, the things that's going on in the world, as pointed out in the lesson last week, in Hosea 8, 12, it talks about his word seemed as some strange thing to them. You know, think about that. If you don't, your faith is not built up that you don't know what God's word is, you're probably less apt to go to follow it. So as Christians, we need to grow in just the same way with praying. As we think about it, there are those who pray sparingly. Sometimes you think about that just maybe when they need to or something going on in their life. Well, probably not when something good is going, but just when it's bad. But, you know, as always, when you think about statistics, there was a 2007 Pew Forum U.S. Religious Landscape Survey, and it revealed that 60% pray once a day. Out of the ones that were sampled, it said only 60% of them pray once a day. Now, what does that mean for the other 40 that, that did did they not at all? That's what the, the statistics would say. So if people get to the point that they quit seeing the power in prayer, as it talks about James, effective for the fervent, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So those are things that's important for us. But as we see this, you can kind of see a trend in, in a society that is more gauged about what makes me happy, what I want, how I want to live. You can kind of see that trend going that way. But us as Christians, we need to reverse that trend specifically in our lives and teach other people the same way. That's important for us. That means 40% don't pray on a regular basis. And as Christians, we don't want to be that. So Jesus was concerned that people not reach this point as we'd already talked about. This is so dangerous. And you see a world that don't even acknowledge God very little in any situation. It's a sad place for us to be also. Right. Those who pray self-righteously, I think this is something that we really need to consider <clears throat> as we think about praying self-righteously. You remember the Pharisee that was told about when he went, the, the two went up to pray? And I think that's important for us, the attitude of the self-righteous one. What did he say? He said, I'm thankful I'm not like this other man over here. He was more concerned about him in a situation that he was in, thinking he was better, rather than to think about his own situation. What did the, the publican or the sinner say? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now think about that difference in attitudes when we pray. You know, we're not better than anybody else. You know, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And that's the attitude that we need to have when we think about those things. We need, don't need to be like that. That self-righteousness is not good. Our righteousness is determined by what God says. And we live our lives that way. Also, you want to think about the self-righteous, the ones who take pride in how much they pray. <coughs> Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, he tells us, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, and they may be seen by men. Now surely I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. When you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. 
And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do. For those that, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. This is a typical, you know, thinking about doing things just to be seen, just for the pat on the back, just so I can, you know, be known. And you see in the Pharisees, stuff like that, a lot of that in the culture at that time, that's what they looked up to, making those long prayers. And everybody think, oh, how religious they are. Yeah. But what Jesus talked about them, he said they're like wide sepulchers, sepulchers. You know, beautiful on the outside, but inside, what did it say? Full of dead men's bones. So as we think about this, this is important not to be self-righteous. These are hypocrites that give religion a bad name. And that's things that we need to think about for ourselves as well. Also, those who pray selfishly. People who use prayer only for personal requests. You think about I, I, me. And naturally, we all have things that we need. Because Jesus said, give, you know, in the model prayer that we talk about sometimes, he says, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts and forgive our debts. You know, the different aspects of it. There are things that we need to, for ourselves. But we need to be vigilant about the needs of other brothers and sisters and people that are struggling. Pray for one another. It's important for us as we think about this. Yes, amen. <clears throat> Prayer is to be made for all men. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all men. It's just like we talked about on our prayer board over here, different ones that are struggling with sicknesses, illnesses, might have tests coming up, or just whatever the case may be. We remember those in prayer. It's a good idea. You know, that's a lot of names off. You can't remember them. If you phone, snap a picture. That's you to go back to it. It's like on our, uh, our bulletins there. A lot of the names are on here. Keep those in mind. I'll tell you, they prayer when you pray and you bring a specific name or know what's going on to that before God. That's helpful for us to think about that. And that's what we should do. It should be more about helping others and not necessarily all about us. We need to be thankful for you know, the things that we have and the blessings that we're given, but also we need to be concerned about our fellow brothers and sisters that are struggling with illnesses, sicknesses, or hard places in life. Lots of things go on, and we need to be aware of that. Many people use prayer only as a personal tool, a giving tool. Then we come to the point, the type of prayer that we need to be those who pray earnestly with intent and a purpose, realizing we're praying to a God that can give us what we need and is able to answer. Those things are important for us. Visually and thanksgiving prayers for others. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 tells us, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in thanksgiving. Meanwhile, pray also for us that God will open to us a door for the word to speak the ministry of Christ, for which I am also in chains. I think it's important for us. Pray earnestly. Pray for one another. You know, a lot of times we talk about it's easy to protect or have a, a, a supplication or a special request when somebody's struggling, but we need to keep in mind those prayers of thanksgiving. And especially when we look into our lives and we see God working in our lives. Sometimes you see, you're, if you're lucky enough that you, to recognize God's providence in your life, have you ever seen something or something happen just at the right time and you think, oh Lord, thank you so much. This I just need you this. Or, or, you know, to help the situation to give you some relief. I think it's important. Amen. Like the phrase in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, a phrase is one of you, a bond servant in Christ Jesus, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in his prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Praying for spiritual strength for one another. As you think about him, he might not know everybody was there, but he knows that there were Christians there that were fighting the same fight that we are, that are struggling to be faithful to God. Right. And he was praying for them. Yeah. And there's people all over this world, you know, I've often used this illustration, just like we're worshiping here. I know there's different time zones, but on the first day of the week, in one part of the world, it's our, the first day of the week has already came to pass. But they are people gathered doing the same things that we're doing here this morning all over this world. Right. That's particularly the Lord's Supper and 
sung praises and prayed to God and given their means as they've been blessed. Lessons are being taught all in worshiping God. But we do it from the heart. And we're grateful for this. You think about some of the places we talk about in countries, you know, that we pray for the to be able to do this unhindered, unabated, without worry. There are places in the world, even nowadays, that you can't do that. You can't do it openly. You've got to hide to do it. But as we think about that, the importance of proper prayer. Now think about this. Prayer has a lot of things that's good for us. It's important that we pray. The first one we'll be thinking about for the forgiveness of sin. Because as a Christian, you know, when we obey the gospel to begin with, you know, our sins are washed away. We have the benefit of God's grace and mercy. When I say washed away, it means everything from that point back is forgotten. Amen. Then you have the benefit of God's grace and mercy from that point forward. But how do you get that? You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to confess them to God and acknowledge your wrong going on and turn from it and try to do better and pray about it and ask for forgiveness. John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7-10. through 10. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. So, you know, it's something we need to be humble and realize that we're human beings and that we struggle. But when we do, we confess and pray about it and ask for forgiveness of it. That's a, a very great reason to pray, to pray. As you think about it, for peace of mind. I can tell you one thing right now. I don't know anybody that everything always goes the way they want to. That they ain't always some kind of hardship or that you're struggling with something or worried. Because I can tell you my life is at different points. Not all the time, but at different points is full of that. Right. But as we think about this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> let God know about it. How can, I mean, He knows, but He wants you, you, me, all of us, to talk to Him about it. And that's all we've got to do. As a child of God, they'll think about that and the peace that comes from that. Often when troubles and trials and things happen in the world, there's a phrase, and I've used it, and I've probably used it here before, and I'm, if I haven't, I'm sure I will more than once. It came to fights. Talk about different things that happen in the Bible. Same way in our lives. Things happen. It will come to pass. But we can go to God and pray for strength and understanding and help in those times of need. You know, think about that, that peace that guards our hearts and minds, how important that, that is. That's something that we should desire. And we can get that from prayer. Right. Strength to live. Yeah. Now, I think about this as we think about strength to live. Some days it's easier to go out and get on with life than others. Some days it's hard. Talking about the things we've already, that, would, that we would want peace of mind from. But we can get strength to live from prayer. Paul prayed that in Ephesians might strengthen the inner man. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. For the reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might through his spirit, the inner man. Inner man. Now you think about this. It talks about the outward man. You know, it's dying day by day, but the inner man can be renewed through His Word, through having our faith built strong and all that, to have our spiritual well-being strong in this aspect of prayer. It's important for us. Amen. When we need to be strong, Christians can likewise pray for themselves. We can pray for one another. Oftentimes we do that when we know about situations going on. We can pray for one another and encourage one another. It's helpful. I think it's something that we should pray for. <laughs> Opportunity to serve. 
You know, as Christians, I think we all should want to do what we can in our lives to be able to help the cause of Christ. We all have responsibility to do what we can do. I mean, if it, you know, if talking to somebody, you don't feel comfortable with that, you can pass tracks out or you can invite somebody to come to service or invite somebody if you, have, if you want to have a Bible study. We, I know some people that'd be willing to, I'd be willing to, to come with them. Because you think about this, as individuals, we can have an open door with somebody that we know a lot easier than somebody that they don't know at all. Sometimes just being that person to be there, we can do that. But this is something we need to have pray for opportunities to serve. Now you think about this, and this is talking about Paul and Apollos, when he's talking about some things going on, there was a little bit of factions and stuff, but we realize that we're all just twos in what God has done when we think about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Who then is Paul, or who then is Apollos, but the ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. Now think about that. It's just like when you think about Philip and the, and the eunuch. When Philip was told to get up and go and to meet the chariot, he didn't know who it was. Didn't know what. The, you know, I'm sure he kind of had an idea what the reason was for. But when he got there, what did he do? He preached the gospel. He started with what he was reading. Because sometimes those opportunities to serve, you never know when they might come. You might be standing in line at the grocery store at Walmart, getting ready to check out, and that might be an open door and opportunity to teach somebody. Or just to say something that can open that door, give a person a chance to grow. I think it's important. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. It says, Meanwhile, pray for all, of, uh, for all of us that God will open to us a door for the word to speak the ministry of Christ, for whom I am in chains, Paul says. Now think about it. That God will open to us a door for the word. Here in a few months, we'll be moving down to a new location. We'll be having a lot more people come by. There's more people that we can come in contact with down there. Door knockings and just getting out because in a better place. You think about that. Those open doors. Receptive hearts. People looking for the truth. I think just like when we think about the Cornelius. Them prayers that he was uh, He's wanting to know what to do. He was doing good, but he didn't know how to do it. But what, the, what did that get him? Peter was sent to come to him. He was told to go get Peter. And that was the first Gentile conversion. And no, I don't were open because of that. Don't we want the Lord to give us an opportunity to lead others to Christ? We sing a song sometimes. I'm not sure if it's in this book or not. I know for years sung out of the old sacred selections. You never mentioned him to me. You met me day by day and you knew where I was astray. Yet you never mentioned him. For us as a Christian, isn't that a scary thought? To know that you had interaction with somebody at points and periods through our life, but we never took advantage of it. Something for us to think about. That's scary. Amen. But as we think about this, pray for opportunity to serve. Pray for boldness to speak. I know sometimes that it, it's if we get in situations specific, especially as preachers that uh, to have to, to speak because it's easy to talk when you're in the, amongst the crowd that you know, like precious faith and believe but when you get in people that don't sometimes in certain situations it can be tough but as we think about that that's what we need to do when the apostles needed boldness they prayed and God delivered you can read about that in, in Acts chapter 4, 23 to 231, but I'm not going to read the whole statement, but I'm going to read, I got like 29 through 31. And it says, beginning in verse 29, Now, Lord, look on our threats and grant to your servants that we all, that with all boldness that we speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal the signs and the wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with all boldness. Now think about that. With all boldness. That's something for us to consider when we think about speaking. Sometimes when we need the courage to do that, just pray for it. 
you know, and I think that's important for you. Wisdom to guide. I think it's just something that we really need to consider too. Wisdom to guide. Wisdom is not is not knowledge, but insight that makes the best of the knowledge that one has. You know, a lot of times as we think about it, uh, I've worked at, I'm going to give an uh, illustration when it comes to the coal mines or uh, secular jobs. You learn a lot by experience. And a lot of times that experience is messing something up. I'm speaking as being an electrician. So when you come back to that, that again, that thought goes off in your mind. I know not to do that. That's wisdom you gain by doing something. And we all can gain that wisdom as we realize that's important for us as Christians. Sometimes we think about helping one another. We think about praying for one another is what we're talking about. But when a person's dealing with a situation, you think about somebody that can give you some wise counsel and say, well, hey, one time in my life I was dealing with a situation similar to yours, and I've done this and I wish I wouldn't. You know, just tell you something. This is something I'm telling you what not to do. You think about how good that is, but you think about that prayer, but you think about how important wisdom is for us. The Christian has promised wisdom through prayer without doubt. We have to realize that God can and will give us, and is able to, but we ask not doubting. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally without reproach. It will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave that is driven by the sea, tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We talk about our spiritual health and well-being. You think about the three lessons that we've already talked about. Our hearing, our reading, our prayer. You know, our faith is constantly being built as we hear and as we read. And we read different account upon account of the things that God has done for the faithful and how that it has worked out in their life. Our faith is built. We should carry that over into our prayer life, and that will help us to grow as Christians. But now think about that, that God can do it. Don't we want the wisdom that comes from above, not from man? I think it's important for us as we consider this. Something else important to pray for is healing from sickness. I don't know of anyone that's not touched by sickness. Because as we think about that, we look around, you know, as you get older, the check engine light comes on as you want to think about it. There's problems. Sometimes you don't have to be very old to have those problems to deal with. But this is important for us. And it's a great blessing that we have when we're sick. Those who are sick should ask the elders to pray for them. James chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. If anyone among you is sick, let them call the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And their prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sin, it will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I think that's important. Amen. And we don't need to underrate it or take it for granted. Prayer is something that's important for us as we think about these things. We need to have prayer for tranquility and peace. I think this is something that's really important for us. As we think about 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, Therefore I exhort First of all, that with supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all men, for the kings or, or all who are in authority, we, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Think about that. Our leaders. I know sometimes we might have leaders that are not even close to being godly. But we pray for them to have that knowledge and wisdom understanding of what God would want them to know. That they'd make decisions that would be pleasing to God. And the, But we were to pray for them that that would happen because you realize all people have a choice. They can make choices just like we do. We have the idea. God has given everyone free will. They can choose to do what they want to or they can choose to follow God's will. It's up to them. And I think that's important for us as we think about these things. 
Next, as we go through this, I got some steps for better praying. I'm just going to mention a few things. I had some verses and stuff to talk about, I, I, and I'll share them with you. But for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them real quick. Steps for better praying. I think this is important for us as we think about this. Pray systematically. This idea of having, you know, trying to have you a pattern, trying to set a time out for this. I know it's hard sometimes. Our life might not be the same every day, but as much as you can be consistent in your prayer life, the better off you'll be. Anything that you do in life, and so even like with your young kids, consistency, teaching them to do things, is better. You do the same thing the same way every day, they learn. In our prayer life, it should be the same way. Pray systematically. Think about this. In Psalms chapter 55, verse 17, it talks about evening, morning, and noon, I will pray and cry aloud. And it says, and he will hear my voice. Now think about that. Evening, morning, and noon, I will cry aloud. He will hear my voice. That's important for us. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, he talked about after the proclamation, saying that they couldn't pray to nobody else but the king, that he went to his room and prayed three times a day, just like his custom had been. I mean, he done it all his life. He wouldn't want to stop now. His faith was in God. Uh, you know, now think about that. That's just a, a, an illustration or a simple thing, a sample that you could think about. Having that effective prayer in their lives. I was watching this uh, video on Appian Media. They have a lot of good content. They done, uh, got this one video talking about the book of Revelation. It's a really good study. In it. But they was interviewing these different couples, young couples, and went. To, this one went over somewhere in the Middle East and worked for a place that's building airplanes and things. And it's in a Muslim place, you know, that uh, a real presence there. And he said, one thing grow, they didn't have a lot of the conveniences and technology that they did have. And the Muslims have their heart or whatever they're called to prayer at certain times of the day. He said, honestly, he said, that really helped their prayer life because like when they think about it, so well, that right now, get us in a habit. And that's something that we need is to have that habit. Whenever it is, however it fits in your schedule, that's something that we need to have for our spiritual growth. Amen. Is be systematic and just don't do it sporadically or just when you take a notion to. Pray spontaneously. You know, on the spur of the moment. And I'm reminded, you remember when Nehemiah was before the king and the king realized that he was gloomy, that something was bothering him, and he, he prayed about this right before he went up, and just a word or two. Yeah. You know, just right on the spur of the moment. Sometimes that's all it needs when you realize these situations. I think it's important for us. You know, a lot of times as we talk about, in, uh, as mentioned in the Bible study Wednesday night, our, uh, our Facebook chat group where messages and stuff are relayed, taking the time to pray when you see that. I mean, I, mean, I know sometimes you might take a minute to get to it, but as quick as you can, take the opportunity to do that. I think it's important for us that spontaneously, don't wait. Pray as the occasion calls for it. Pray secretly. As we look from the habit of Jesus, you remember, as you get time to get off to yourself or, or away, sometimes for busy people, that might just be in your car on the way home where there ain't nobody around. But take the time to do that. Pray simply. It's not how the prayer is worded. It's not how many fancy words that you can use. It's a prayer from the heart. You know, bearing your heart to God and what you're struggling with, what you're dealing with. That's important for us. Be steadfast about it. Just like the scripture that we've referenced in Luke chapter 18, 1 through 8. You remember the one, the persistent widow that just kept going back, kept going back. Keep praying and don't lose hope. Yeah, I'm sure there's plenty more that you could think to add to this list. But for the sake of time, you know, I think this is this is a pretty good idea. Because we think about spiritual health and well-being, these are things that we want to consider. Prayer is a vital, important part, just like the other two lessons that we had, to our spiritual health and well-being. So I hope this morning, as you take these things into consideration, that you would gauge, do your own test on yourself on these different topics and see where you stand if you need to work on things and need to improve, that you will do so. If your spiritual health is not where it needs to be, that you'll 
work and get it to where it needs to be. And as young Christians, I know sometimes some of these things, I hope that as we think about this, how important that it is. It's not something to be taken for granted. It's something that's important in our life. So I hope that you do that. If you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you to do that. Come, you know, believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, willing to confess it and ready to repent of your sins and be buried with Him in baptism. The water's ready. We'll take care of that right now. But as a Christian, if you struggle and fall short and you desire the prayers of the church, we'll be glad to pray with you and for you. But if you have a need, either way, you can come make it known while we stand and say, Father Jesus, <laughs> he will.